Closed captioning for this program has been provided by Verizon Communications. The search for life and loved ones continues as President Bush promises victory against terrorism. For complete coverage, stay with CNN. Upgrade to America's Top 150 package and take off with Great American Country and Dish Network. You'll receive the Top 150's latest programming edition, Great American Country, the newest 24-hour country music channel, bringing you your favorite superstars, classic artists, and new talent. You'll also be automatically entered to win a trip for two to Nashville. Call 1-800-333-DISH to upgrade today and get more music, better country from Great American Country and Dish Network. Call 1-800-333-DISH now. Ordinary town. You're not that Wilson that's a fortune teller, are you? An ordinary woman. I don't call myself that. You think we'll live happily ever after? An extraordinary gift. You see something bad? On pay-per-view comes the heart-stopping thriller of a deadly mystery. I'm messing with the devil's gonna get you burned. And one woman with the ability to uncover the truth. Somebody's gonna try and kill me. The Gift. Rated R. Playing on pay-per-view. This is CNN. Hello, I'm Wolf Blitzer in Washington. Here's the latest news. Stocks plunge at the start and never recover. The Dow loses nearly 700 points, the biggest single-day point loss ever. Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill tells CNN's Lou Dobbs there's no need for panic. The crops are still growing in the fields, and the people are still showing up in the factories, and the shopkeepers are out there. Uh, even here in Midtown New York, you can begin to feel a quickening pace again. Uh, we'll get our act together. We're going to be okay. Despite today's financial losses, President Bush says he has great faith in the U.S. economy. Earlier in a visit to the Pentagon, he said the resolve of the armed forces has never been stronger. CNN senior White House correspondent John King has more. Rallying the troops at the Pentagon and talking tough at the mention of Osama bin Laden. You want bin Laden dead? I want him held. I want. I want justice. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said "Wanted, dead or alive." More tough talk at the White House. Current U.S. law forbids assassinations, but the president's spokesman pointedly noted there are exceptions. The executive order does not limit the United States' ability to act in self-defense. It is going after bin Laden in an act of self-defense. I'm not going to define all the steps that may or may not be taken. This Pentagon meeting dealt with the coming call-up of National Guard and Reserve Forces. And key advisors were at the White House earlier in the day to discuss a menu of military options that includes sending elite infantry troops into Afghanistan. U.S. officials reported progress on the diplomatic front. Sources tell CNN, Pakistan, Russia, and India are among the nations sharing their intelligence on the bin Laden organization. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates promised to scale back ties with Afghanistan's ruling Taliban. And French President Jacques Chirac and the British Prime Minister Tony Blair agreed to come to Washington this week to plot strategy. The White House said the rocky first day back on Wall Street was to be expected. But there was a sense of urgency as the president huddled with top economic advisors to discuss a multi-billion dollar emergency aid package to the airline industry and an emergency mix of new spending and a capital gains tax cut to help Wall Street and the broader economy. I'm confident we can work with Congress to come up with an economic stimulus package, if, if need be, that will send a clear signal to the risk takers and capital, capital forma formators of our country that the government's going to act too. Senior aides describe the president as a bit tired and sometimes frustrated as he deals with the twin challenges posed by last week's terrorist attacks. Planning a military campaign, aides say will be anything but conventional and trying to keep an economy that already was struggling from sliding into recession. John King, CNN, the White House. In Afghanistan, an Islamic council is to meet tomorrow to decide what to do about the U.S. demand to turn over Osama bin Laden. The United Nations reports tens of thousands of Afghan refugees are streaming toward Iran and Pakistan in fear of possible military strikes. In New York, no new survivors were found today at Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan. Mayor Giuliani says the search will continue until hope is lost. And speaking of hope, here's a hopeful sign. Major League Baseball is back 
as 12 teams take to the field tonight, fans are combining love of the game with their love of country. I'm Wolf Blizzard uh, in Washington. I'll be back at the top of the hour with a look at military options facing the United States. Now back to our Crossfire town meeting at George Washington University here in the nation's capital. Welcome back to our special Crossfire Town Meeting here at George Washington University with our studio audience and our panel of experts. We're debating and discussing how America responds to terrorism. Here with Tucker Carlson. Tucker. Thank you, Bill. First we question had from our group. No trouble rustling up questions from this group. This is Javier Martinez from Phoenix, Arizona. What's your question? What I want to know is what is being done to protect the Arab Americans within the United States? Senator Allen, what is being done? I think people are on heightened alert in a lot of different ways in this country, worried about terrorist threats and so forth. I think it's incumbent on all leaders, whether it's the president, whether it's the senator, whether it's a, lo whether it's a local sheriff, to understand that what, is, what makes America great and unique is that a government has been instituted two, de two centuries ago to protect individual rights. And while we're fighting this terrorist threat, there's no reason, and in fact, we cannot abrogate basic human rights, whether that's freedom of expression, the writ of habeas corpus being available, no unwarranted searches and seizures, and you don't discriminate peop against people because of their ethnic origin, their religious beliefs. And so there have been a few unfortunate and terrible attacks on, on people of, of Arab descent. And everywhere I've seen, there's, there's been outrage over it. And so we, we do need to make sure that there is protection. I spoke to a family who lives rel relatively nearby me uh, of uh, Islamic descent. I'm not going to say which country they're from, but Muslims. And, and if you talk to those youngsters and see how they feel, they feel they're, they're first and foremost American citizens, regardless of their, their ethnicity. They feel as bad as anybody who may be from Ireland or France or Japan or Korea or Mexico or anywhere else. They feel violated. We need to understand that all Americans share this grief and there's no reason. In fact, we have to be on heightened alert that we don't have any of these, these malicious attacks on persons or their facilities, their places of worship or, or uh, businesses. Robin, I see you want to follow up and I want to ask you, I mean, is there a religious, are there religious roots to, to, these, to this, these acts of terrorism? Absolutely not. There's nothing in Islam exactly. in the same way there's nothing in Christianity or Judaism that encourages suicide actions or the killing of innocents. Uh, I think the president actually took a very important step today by going to a mosque, trying to make sure that everyone understands this is not a war against Arabs or Muslims, but it's a war between civilization and terrorists. I see, uh, Jim, let me get a question for you, okay, and then we'll get you in the... Go ahead, real quickly, quickly sure. Not only is it terribly wrong for Americans to discriminate against and attack Arab Americans or Muslims, it is incredibly stupid because if the FBI is going to have... And it's, and it's dangerous. If the FBI is going to have any opportunity in rooting out some of the people who may be here that are still terrorists. They're going to need the cooperation of the Muslim American community, the Arab American community. And no one is doing more damage to the fight against terrorism than the idiots who are persecuting American Muslims and Arab Americans. And this is Mark from San Francisco. Mark. Uh, I've been hearing the phrase "war against terrorism" used a lot in the last couple of week, uh, the last week, and I was wondering. Uh, I can't help but think that's very similar to the phrase "war on drugs" that was declared in the late '80s. And I was wondering what are the differences between the war on drugs and the war on terrorism, so we don't lose this war on terrorism. James Lee, what do you want to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of difference between the war on drugs and war on terrorism. I mean, you physically have a threat to our freedom, and and it's a serious threat. And I think to follow up too, and the question was asked a while ago, I think every person has value and every person should be respected. And that's what we're all about in America. And you know, every person, does, we do not want to give up our, our freedom. So the war on terrorism is a different than the war on drugs, totally different. It's a threat against our freedom. And that's why it's so important that we win this war. 
Yes, thank you. The, the war on drugs and the war on terrorism have some analogies, and, and I think that our law enforcement, our military, and our intelligence folks ought to be given the same tools that our law enforcement are given on the war on drugs. The war on drugs is very difficult, and obviously it comes from a lot of places in our streets, and, and maybe it's not as quite as direct, obviously, as bombing of the World Trade Centers or the Pentagon. But you know what? In infiltrating and fighting the war on drugs, one of the ways you do it is you have to infiltrate these groups. You have to pay informants. You need to make undercover drug buys. You need surveillance. Those same tactics as law enforcement or, or, or uh, intelligent eff intelligence efforts have to be utilized here on the war on terrorists. It cannot be done from only satellites. We do need to pay informants. And, and uh, the director well knows that there are prohibitions on us paying informants or putting under hire those who have been convicted of certain crimes. Well, you know, when you're dealing with a bunch of sharks, sometimes you have to use sharks to attract them and cut up those sharks for bait and, and bring them in. You're not dealing with the most uh, savory folks. These are not choir boys that you're dealing with. So we ought to allow our law enforcement, whether external or internal, or, you know, I'm talking FBI or whether most likely the CIA, to hire on some of these other folks that are in that nest of scorpions to help us find out who's, who's at risk to our country. That is done on the war on drugs. We need to take those handcuffs off our law enforcement and intelligence okay. so they can better protect us as well as themselves. And scorpion. Thank you, Senator. This is Christina Pentec no from Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Christina, what's your question? Hi, I was wondering about the implicit risks in, in attacking um, countries that support terrorism and um, feeding the flame in terrorism by doing so. Now, Robin Wright, you were just in Afghanistan last year. Paint a word picture for us. What it would mean to send ground troops into Afghanistan? What do you think that would, what sort uh, of repercussions that would have? You know, it strikes me that Somalia and Beirut and Vietnam all look easy by comparison. This is a society without infrastructure. There are not roads to travel on. The logistical difficulties in some kind of military operation in Afghanistan are really unprecedented. Um, and I think you point out a very important issue. How we conduct this war will be critical in determining whether we actually eliminate the whole phenomena or just a group of people and in danger producing even more, we end up prolonging the war as a result. We have a question here from Tabitha. Tabitha is from Williamsburg, Virginia. Senator, a constituent of yours, so be careful. It's Tabitha, but I'm... Tabitha, I'm very sorry. It's okay. Um, I was wondering, what is the possibility that the Bush administration will dramatically change its foreign policy, considering we've been kind of awakened from a slumber? The director, do you want to direct that to anyone particular? Uh, why not, Senator Allen? Why not? <laughs> you are from Williamsburg or James City County, right? Um, I'm from uh, James City County. Um, I've lived there all my life. It's well, nice. My point. parents voted for you. Well, good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I think that the Bush foreign policy, obviously his focus, President Bush is very focused on unrooting out terrorism. He is worried in what Robin was talking about is how are we going to uh, procure this war, so to speak and how we're going to be sure and making sure there's as little damage to those who are not guilty or complicit. There is also a concern that there are those terrorists still here in this country and when we do strike that there could be retaliation here and it may not be taking over an airplane, it may be who knows what. But I think as far as our policy and the principles of this country, we're staying strong. There are those who say that we should back off our support for Israel. I say we stick with our friends. We stick with those who value freedom and democracy. We cannot be cowed by terrorists, and I think the Bush administration is as resolved as ever no, to keep their policy. Let me, let me ask you there. I mean, is it po the question is, as I understand Tabitha's question, is our policy perhaps too one-sided in the Middle East so that we are generating hatred toward the United States? Well, the United States historically has been, I think, fairly even-handed in the, in the Middle East. We've supported Israel for, for years. Israel's a democracy over there, but we have uh, made common cause with uh, moderate uh, Arab states. Uh, we tried for years to broker a, a settlement uh, between uh, Israel and, uh, and the Palestinians. Uh, a very, very generous offer was uh, made to Yasser Arafat last year by Barack. He turned it down. Uh, I don't regard our position in the Mideast as having been improperly in one direction or another. I think what, what has to happen 
is that the Bush administration needs 